That's a technical answer for a technical interview. You are not interviewing for a security engineer position. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's edition of Life of a CISO, one of my favorite times where I get to sit down and talk about my favorite topic, cybersecurity and cybersecurity strategies. So the first thing I want to cover is one of the things I get a lot in terms of questions and Q&A is interviewing. And it seems like there's a lot of people that don't think they have the proper qualifications or the proper experience to be a CISO. Now, yes, experience does matter, but ultimately when it comes down to a new position, such as a chief information security officer, there's not a lot of people with a lot of experience. Yes, there's a few folks like myself and others that sort of pioneered the area and were CISOs before it was called a CISO, but that's few and far between. Many of the folks out there are very much like you with some core experience, core understanding, but not necessarily have held those positions before. So ultimately, what it comes down to is not what experience you have, but can you fly the plane? Can you deliver on that job function? It's one of those things that almost every organization that's looking for a CISO today has tried and failed multiple times. So the executives and other people are a little hesitant. And the reason why they are hesitant and the reason why they failed, and this is what you really need to know, is because the person was too technical. The person didn't understand business, didn't understand strategy, and they were basically a really, really good technical security engineer. And if you followed any of my podcast, you would know that world-class security engineers don't necessarily make world-class CISOs unless, boom, they do a mind shift. They have to shift and think about the problem differently. So in many cases, your primary job of the resume and the pre-screening with HR is to get an interview with the executives because ultimately what they want to see is this somebody who understands the business and that can be one of us or is this just another security engineer that's going to be super super technical because guess what we got those right most companies have world-class security engineers and the problem is the executives don't understand what they're saying so the trick is this when you get that interview you need to own the first five minutes. They're gonna make a decision very quickly, even though the interview might go for 30 or 40 minutes, they're gonna make a decision within the first few minutes. And what you wanna do is when you start off that interview, you own and control it. But, but Eric, they're gonna be asking me questions. Yes, but you can take those questions anywhere you want. I do a lot of TV interviews and I've gone through a lot of media training. And what makes somebody a great interviewee, the, the person who actually is giving the content, is they know the problem, they have their talking points, and they get it across in a very concise period of time. Because when I'm on, whether it's CNN, Fox, CBS, ABC, typically, it is a three or five minute segment. And five minutes is rare, usually it's on the three. So if I get there and the person interviewing me is not a technical expert, they don't understand or know the problem. In many cases, I've given them the questions or somebody else has given them the questions. So if I sit there and try to thoroughly answer that question, I'm gonna run out of time and it's gonna be a terrible interview. So I'm going into that interview with, here's the three points that I need to cover. And I have my statements. I have the 
two or three, eight or nine word sentences that I want to get across. For example, I, I recently did one, cybersecurity is every organization's problem. So I, I get that across. While many people might claim that there's advanced adversaries out there, many of their te techniques are basic and these attacks are preventable. Boom, that's my second point. So I know what I want and I control that interview. And that's why in a lot of cases, they ask me back because I'm prepared, controlled, and I know what they want to hear. I know what the audience needs to hear to get the impact. That's how you need to go into an interview. You need to be prepared and ready to go. And some of your key talking points, you need to understand the business. You need to understand the business they're in, their revenues. And the good news is most of these organizations are publicly traded organizations. So you can get a feel for their revenue because it's publicly available, right? You can read their filings, right? It's all out there. Even large privately held companies with LinkedIn and these other sources, you can still get a general size of the organization and you can understand how big they are, number of employees and things along those lines. So what you wanna make sure you do is when you go in to that interview, whatever that first question is, whether it's, uh, hi, Dr. Cole, can you tell us about your background? or I'm wondering how you think you could help the organization, or I'm noticing X, Y, and Z, could you provide a little more detail? I'm gonna right away. Now, if, if they ask a question, where did you grow up? I'm not gonna not answer the question, right? So I'm not gonna go in, I'm gonna, I'm of course, tell them I, I grew up in New York, but the point is anything that's sort of generic in that area, you wanna control and take it right here. I'm a seasoned cybersecurity professional that understands cybersecurity strategy. I understand that your business is currently at 800 million and you've grown by 22% over the last three years. I also know that you're struggling with foreign competitors in these three market areas. I believe that by properly protecting cybersecurity, it can actually be a business enabler. I feel that we can help develop some new technology that allows this data to be accessible anywhere, any place, any time with proper security in place to make sure that information is protected and that can give you a competitive advantage. Boom, you got the job. If you go there, you got the job. A couple things I wanna point out. I showed I could fly the plane and I immediately went in and said, I understand the business. I can speak their language and that my job is to enable the business to be successful. Notice, I didn't say anything about firewalls, technology, AI, false positives, migration, cloud, any of those things. That's the mistake that a lot of people that are new to the CISO position make. They'll go in and they'll be like, well, at my previous organization, I led a technology team where we actually implemented a brand new architecture that included over 35 different firewalls and VLANs, and we were able to reduce false pop. They don't care. That's a technical answer for a technical interview. You are not interviewing for a security engineer position. If you were, that would be a great answer. But we need to get out of that mindset and show them very quickly, you can fly the plane. So I'll, I'll tell people all the time and I coach them that, listen, don't worry about the experience, worry about the, well, don't even worry because you'll, you'll do awesome if you follow what I said, but in those first two to three minutes, own the interview. Be very comfortable with it and it needs to be authentic. It can't look like it's reading a script. Like if you go in and they ask you a question and you're like, I believe that your organization can have over blah, blah, blah growth. And I know that you made over 30 million, but like you're just, you, you're redundant. No, you gotta be enthusiastic, believe it, and have that information embedded within you. You can't be trying to go, wait a second, how many employees, right? Boom, you just like, what's your name, where you live, where you grew up, what's the organization? My recommendation for folks that get CISO positions just want to take a quick break. I hope you're enjoying the show. I have this free webinar that I would love for you to check out if you want to become a world-class CISO. Is they invest anywhere from 15 to 20 hours researching the company before they go into the interview. 
they sometimes know more about the company than the executive itself. One of my favorite, favorite examples is one of my higher end coaching clients. I helped them in there and three days before they actually announced an acquisition. And the CEO, of course, knew that they were acquiring the company, but he didn't realize it was publicly announced. So, so this person went in there and, and said, oh yeah, and I know that your company is gonna increase by 60% because you acquired company XYZ, and I, I believe this is critical because uh, blah, 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 blah. And the CEO was like, wait a second, who told you that? And they're like, well, that was publicly available on your website. And they started making calls going, did we release that? So in some cases, they knew even more than the executive. That's where you wanna be now. You don't wanna be the smartest person in the room because you're not gonna win that. So check the ego, check your security engineer, and make sure that you're focused on showing you can fly that plane. And the three things you wanna get across is you understand their business, you understand their language, which is dollars, financial, and growth, and that you're going to enable them to be successful. Notice I gave that example in that mock interview that I believe that we can roll out some new ways to access information remotely in a better and more secure manner. I didn't say we have to stop doing X, we have to stop doing Y. I didn't say we're disabling the business. I showed that I'm thinking as an enabler of the business to grow the business. So if you focus on those areas, you will ace the interview and you will become a world-class CISO. Now, what I'd like to cover in this episode are, and it ties directly to what we talked about, are some of the key questions that a CISO or somebody who wants to be a CISO needs to know the answer to. Remember, from your resume, from your past experience, and from other interviews, they are going to check the box that you know cybersecurity. They wanna know, are you a business person and can you integrate into the business? So the most important question that any CISO or prospective CISO or somebody who wants to be a CISO must know the answer to is what is the company's business and how do they make money? When I do security assessments, one of the first things we do when we go on site or if we do a virtual assessment, travel starting to pick up again, which is good. It's, I always love interacting with people face to face. But I'll always sit down with the financial person and say, can we go through the financials of the business? I wanna understand for the last three years, what is your revenue? What is your profit margin? And what business units or products or services account for what percent of that revenue? And it's funny because I don't know of any other security companies that do that. They're coming in and right away, Show us the firewall, show us the this, show us the that. Well, here's the issue. Cookie cutter security doesn't work. Look at hi history. Look at all these entities that have had major breaches. All of these major breaches, what do they all have in common? In every single one of the breaches that have occurred over the last five years, these companies have had security budgets, some ranging from 20 million the 70 million that they spent on security. They had teams ranging from 30 people to 200 people and every one of them still got breached. Why? Because security wasn't aligned with the business. They didn't understand the business. They didn't understand how they made money. They didn't understand what their margins were and what their biggest exposure was to the business. They just went in with you must have firewalls, you must have IDSs, you must have data encryption, and none of that stuff really matters. And a great example of that is I, I just went on an assessment, I'll periodically go, because uh, I like to just stay in touch with the business and train up some new engineers. And we're training up some new engineers, and in this particular area, they, they were doing some very sensitive testing and processing of information, and in a lab environment, they were using shared accounts to, to log in to the systems. And, and it's funny because this new engineer that I was training up, 
that was using the traditional model was all like, oh, Eric, we, we found a smoking gun, right? Shared accounts, that's really bad, that's really bad. We need to write that up. We need to make that a highest risk. We need to go in and penalize them for them. That's really, really bad. And I stepped back and said, wait a second. Their business is to allow the lab techs to do their job as quickly as possible. They've experienced over 200% growth and they're bringing on new employees at a huge rate. If they had to go in, and a lot of these employees are temp employees, if they had to go in and assign unique IDs to every single person, track them, monitor them, and then remove them, that would not scale with the business because in some cases, they'll go in and based on the workload, at 10 p.m. at night, they'll call a temp agency and say, we need six more people for the midnight shift. Well, guess what? Their IT doesn't work 24 seven. They don't have the staff. So if, if we went in and made that recommendation that every single person must have a unique ID, that would be detrimental to the business. However, the lab should have been isolated. It should have been self-contained. And the real problem that this engineer completely missed was we need to control and monitor the access to the internet. The shared accounts only become an issue when people are going in and going to websites, email, personal email, and others that could allow malicious activity to get into the system. And after a while, that engineer got it, it needs to align with the business. And, and that's the problem not only with a lot of CISOs that have a strong technical background, but even a lot of technical people is they have this mental checklist of security. You can never, ever have shared accounts. Now, generally, it's not good to have shared accounts. Best practices don't have shared accounts. But in this specific case, for the period of time based on their business and how they were making money, it was an acceptable risk based on other mitigating controls that we put in place. And if I went in and forced that issue it would have been detrimental to the business. It would have hurt the business significantly. And like I said, based on other mitigating controls, it wasn't a major or highest priority risk at the time. And I know for some of you that are world-class security engineers, you're still like, but no, Eric, but no, Eric, you can't have it, right? If you're thinking that way and fighting me, from, with love in my heart, you know, that means I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna maybe be a little tough love here. You are probably not CISO material. If you are one of those folks that know, Eric, security is security. It's a checklist. It doesn't matter the business. It doesn't matter the organization. You must never, ever, ever have shared accounts under any situation whatsoever. You should stay as a world-class security engineer because you are not going to be successful as a CISO because you're not thinking about the business. The business is most important and how the business makes money. And then a second question that's tied to that that's very important is what differentiates the business from the competition what makes you unique and different what's sort of the secret sauce that allows you to be as competitive as you are because in almost any business there's a few exceptions but in almost any business there's always going to be competitors there's always gonna be people out there that wanna take your market share and ultimately put you out of business. So you need to understand what that competitive advantage is. And once again, for this particular client, one of their competitive advantages was they could get results back to their customer in six hours when all of their competitors take 15 hours. So once again, if I went in and said that if at 10 p.m. you realize you needed six temps to get these results done a lot quicker, and I said that you had to go through a much rigid onboarding and set up accounts and do all that, and that took 10 hours to do, which was the time frame, it would now take 16 hours instead of six, and they just lost their competitive advantage. So you need to understand how to support and enable the business. Think business enabler and not trying to hurt the business. And then the other question is, and this is from a business standpoint, what it could have the biggest impact on our business? And once again, just generically using this one example, what could have the biggest impact 
on this particular client was if they're not able to get the results back to their clients in the agreed to time frame because they had rigid agreements in place. And if that wasn't happen and they weren't able to do that, they would actually potentially not be able to charge clients, have discounts, have penalties, have other factors come into play, which would be negative. So in that particular case, making sure the availability and accuracy of the information was the top priority. And this is another mistake we see security engineers. A lot of security engineers, because they come from environments where there's sensitive data and there's all these privacy regulations of PII and PHI, they're all about confidentiality, confidentiality, confidentiality. But once again, you need to step back and say from a business perspective, yes, all three are important, but which one is the most detrimental, right? Which one would have the biggest impact to the organization confidentiality? integrity or availability and you need to make sure you always balance those correctly within the environment so if you want to be a world-class CISO understand the business when you go for the interview own the first three minutes showing them you know the business you speak their language and you can go in and enable the business to be successful and in any position if you wanna be a CISO or currently a CISO, make sure you understand what is the business, how they make money, and what is their competitive advantage. And if you do that, you will be a world-class CISO.